All right. Here you go. James well, Johnson, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Mike. <laughs> yep. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, for being here as well for these couple of days. I uh, really enjoy getting to see everybody face to face. And some of you I probably saw at the summit, uh, but uh, most of you probably not, it seems like. Uh, so what uh, Mike wanted me to talk about today is uh, templating, and then we're going to have a, a short break, and then we'll get into some HTML visualization as well, like, like Mike indicated. So uh, talk a little bit about Niagara templates. And uh, I, I suspect most of you probably already understand what templates are, but I'm going to go through and talk real quick about some of the basics of what a template is and what some of the files are and where you're going to find them at, and touch a little bit on station templates, but I'm going to try to focus more on component and device templates and show you really quickly about how to build some of those templates and how you go about deploying and updating those templates. So give you some of the, the idea of some of the workflows and things. Uh, when we talk about a template in, uh, in Niagara 4, it's, it's really this deployable package of things, right? And uh, I'm sure a lot of you uh, probably worked on Niagara back in the R2 days and, and with AX and everything. And uh, oftentimes you start with stations, right, that you've used on previous projects that have uh, things that typical devices that you're using for VAVs or air handlers or tillers or whatever. And you're using that kind of as a library, but it's kind of, it's more difficult to manage, uh, particularly if you change how you're doing some things, like with your engineering standards about how you're programming or designing graphics. It's like which you know which version of this is this thing that I'm starting with. There might be bloat in that station, right? Lots of other services or users or or data and things that you don't realize or remember are there that you need to purge out. So templates give you a, a better way to organize all those files and keep them together. So uh, in addition to the programming that goes in the station. There might be things like image files and PX files and things like that that you want to package together. And that's really what these uh, templates do for you. And it does it with providing some plumbing to give you versioning control as well. So you can have version you know, 1.1, 1.2 of this application as it evolves over time. And it's really easy to update and, and understand which version is deployed on a particular project. Uh, it also really helps you within your own organization if you have you know, multiple employees that do programming to help enforce standards, right? So that everybody's doing things the same way. So that it, you know, if Bob's out on vacation or got hit by a bus or whatever, right, and somebody has to come behind him and work on a project, they don't have to figure out what was Bob's crazy programming, right? If everybody in the company does it the same way with the standard, right, it's easier to come in and do service work or to help out when things are in a pinch. Um, it also helps and customers in a lot of cases with establishing standards, particularly on large projects where maybe there's not an MSI that's driving all that, but you have multiple contractors that are working on uh, on that project. Uh, it helps enforce standards across multiple contractors as well. And when we talk about a template file in Niagara, there's going to be a couple of different extensions that you might encounter. Uh, but basically, all the template files encapsulate at least two files at a minimum. There's a template bog file, which is going to be like a partial bog of that thing that you created a template of, which might be a BACnet device or a Modbus device, or it could be just some wire sheet logic in a folder or things like that. Uh, and there's also a template manifest XML file. So at a minimum, those two files will exist in there. Now, there could be other resource files like images, PX files, HTML files, and things like that included in the template as well. And we have really uh, four different kinds of templates, I would say. And then the extension, they're all really zip files is what they are, uh, but they'll have different extensions. So you have NTPL, uh, which will be an extension on a station template, which is a, a template of an entire station, which is a good starting point. Like when you create a new station, instead of starting with some old station that you have to go cut a bunch of stuff out of and worry about that bloat, you can start with a nice clean station to begin with and then add in the functionality that you need for that project. Those are going to be under your, uh, located under your uh, uh, workbench home or your system home uh, under the uh, new stations, workbench new stations, or it'll be under your Niagara user home under the station templates folder. Then we also have component and device templates, and, and those also are going to have an NTPL extension, and those will be located under your Niagara user home under the templates folder. And then lastly, which I'm not really going to focus on in this presentation, are application templates. And those are going to be templates of, uh, of an application controller like an Edge 10, where you get an Edge 10 out of the box and you just want to install uh, literally 
really a, a station that includes all that application programming for an air handler or fan coil into the device. And those will have an NAPL extension. They'll be located under uh, the application templates folder under your user home. Uh, I'm going to jump over to Workbench here in uh, just a second to show you this as well. Uh, but this is just kind of a little bit, maybe blown up a little bit easier way to kind of look at the fact that an NTPL file is really just a zip file that has these uh, resources and things underneath it. So we'll pop over here to Workbench. A little bit more interesting way to view things, right, than PowerPoints. Don't want to do death by PowerPoint or anything. Uh, so if I look under my Niagara user home, you'll see there's this um, templates folder here. Uh, oh, and and uh, yeah, I'll talk about this real quick, and then I'll talk about station templates for a second. Uh, so uh, this is an NTPL file, and if I double click on it, it's going to load a view here, which is the, the template view. Uh, come on, computer. You can do it. And uh, I'll go into some more details about it, but there is a UI to look at the template, modify it, look at the versioning and things like that. Now, um, there's actually a duplicate button here and if you were ever going to uh, create a, an offshoot a branch on your template design, you would want to use the duplicate button here uh, and I'll, I'll explain to you kind of why you want to do that. But I'm going to go in the file space here and just choose duplicate and I'm going to rename this as a dot .zip file, right? And so you can see that the NTPL is really just a zip file. In this case, it has an images folder that has a bunch of different SV, SVG images. There's a PX folder with lots of PX files that are associated with this. And then there's this template bog file, which is um, you know, a partial bog file in this case of a BACnet device. So I created a template of a BACnet device. So the template bog file will always be called that, but it's gonna, it could be a station. It could be a folder that has logic in it. It could be a network. It could be a device. It could be you know, anything uh, from the station down to something more granular. You'll also also see this uh, manifest XML file here and uh, the XML file is going to give us some information about the template. So you'll see that every template gets a UUID and that's a, I don't know how many character, but it's a, you know, alphanumeric string that uniquely identifies this template. Even if it, if I had uh, 10 templates called AHU, uh, you know, 01 NTPL, they're all going to be unique because they all have their own UUID to them, okay? And that's why you don't want to just duplicate the file and start naming it something else because you're going to end up with lots of templates that all have the same UUID and we lose the ability to uniquely identify it. So you want to use the template view and say duplicate and it'll create a new UUID on that file. Uh, but this has information like what version was it created with, um, things about settings and resources like images and PX files. It also has all the software dependencies here. So it knows uh, what version of Niagara was it created with and uh, what modules are required on the station in order to deploy the template. So if I went to deploy a BACnet template onto a station, it it would need to have obviously the BACnet module installed to be able to do that, right? So that this helps with uh, the versioning control and all that sort of thing, okay? Uh, now, I'm not going to get real in depth with the, the uh, station templates, but I just want to kind of point this out because I do think it, it is potentially a big time saver for you uh, with your own, particularly within your own company. Uh, if you look at the uh, Workbench new stations uh, uh, under the defaults here, you'll see that there's a bunch of NTPL files here. And these are what you'll see listed like when you go into the tools and new station wizard here, right? So uh, if I stretch this out where you can see a little bit better, right? You're being prompted with the new station wizard to pick from uh, station templates, which is a, a, a blank station. I say a blank station, but a pre-configured station with certain services and drivers and things like that in it. And Tridium provides you a bunch of these examples, but you can create additional station templates on your own. So for example, I have this My Company template which is actually under my user home, under my station templates folder, but it could be here as well. And the idea there is that uh, you could start off with one of these uh, templates uh, to start with, and you could click the duplicate button here, and that would allow you to go and assign a new name to it, a new version, numbering scheme and everything, and then you can go modify that template, right? You could add a, a weather report if you always use the weather service. You could add the email service, and you could even maybe configure an outgoing account if you 
have a service account you use to always send alarm emails. You could add all your employees' uh, user accounts under the user service, right? So that when you go to create a new station, it already has all your employees set up as users under the station, right? So the idea is why do you either want to try to take an existing station and cut all the crap out of it, or why do you want to start with a blank station that we give you and then you have to add a bunch of stuff into it? If you're always going to do it a certain way, then create your own station template, and that way when you start a new station, you, you have it the way your company wants to do it with your engineering practices and, and things are already kind of configured and ready to go, right? Uh, so I'm not going to get really any deeper into it right now on the station templates because um, everything you can do with a station template, you can do with a component and device template. So we're going to sort of focus on the uh, component template and device template side of things. Uh, Another way that you can do a station template, by the way, is you can start with one of those, you can get the station running, and then uh, when the station's running, you can right click on, uh, on the uh, config here, and under the templates menu, you can make a station template. So that's another way that you can go about building a station template, is to start with a clean station, put all the stuff you want to have as your, your base, and then make a station template from the running station. So a couple different ways to do that. Now. In this case, uh, I have under my tag dictionary service here, uh, I have some dictionaries. I have a Niagara dictionary, a Haystack dictionary, and I have a building dictionary, which is my own custom dictionary. And it has some different tag definitions in it. There's some uh, you know, relation, uh, relation definition, and there's a bunch of tag rules and things that are in here as well. And these all line up to uh, my naming conventions for points, right, and, and the data model that I want to apply to the application, right? And so so this is a standard that my company wants to use to do data modeling, which fits into my analytics and to, into my PX design, into my hierarchies and things like that. Uh, if I'm working on a large scale system or I do this work for lots of customers, right, I want to have this as a standard uh, so that it's easy to identify like uh, if I've made changes to my engineering standard, things like that. So this would be a good thing to create a template of. And to do that, all I have to do is uh, right click on that component and then choose make template. And that's going to open up this uh, template uh, view here where I can uh, assign a file name here to it. Um, and it's going to create a template underneath my user home here under this uh, templates folder. Now, with 413, we also give you this option with this folder picker. So if you create subfolders under the templates folder, you can organize your templates into subfolders. So it's, it's kind of helpful to be able to do that. And you can see that it, right now it has a draft version and there's an option to set it to ready. Uh, this is more of really to, just a process thing to a, allow you to have a workflow, but it's not a requirement to ever set it to ready. You can deploy a template in a draft state, but it's meant to be kind of like a workflow, workflow type thing. Uh, there's a component tab here on the on this and you'll see that in this case the root component is this tag dictionary uh, and I can see the property sheet of it I can look at property sheets wire sheets slot sheets you know I can change properties I can do any kind of engineering that I need to do for this uh, particular thing and uh, there's also a bunch of other tabs that I'm going to talk about more with the device template in in a few minutes but for the component template and in this case specifically with the tag dictionary I probably don't have a lot of things that I need to do I don't really need to use these other tabs because this is my dictionary and, and it has all my tags and my relations and my tag rules. I just want to set this as a standard for how I'm going to deploy this, right? Uh, so in this case, I'll probably just hit save because I don't need to really do anything else. Uh, and then uh, you can view that template either uh, under the templates folder here. I'll see it there. And I'll also see it listed in my template sidebar here. And uh, so from a uh, a workflow perspective, uh, what you probably want to do is we can change this from a draft to a ready state, and then it's going to prompt me to increment the version number on this. And uh, I can, you know, give it some other descriptions here, right? Building dictionary, and then I can say, like, you know, initial uh, dictionary definitions or whatever, right? And and then I'll just uh, save those changes. So now uh, th this is an indication to me that, hey, this is the approved version that I want everybody in the company to be using because the template's in a ready state, okay? Uh, and there's different ways to deploy component templates. And the simplest way, I'm going to delete my building dictionary here uh, from, the, uh, from my supervisor. And one of the most basic ways to deploy a component template is simply... Uh, to click on it and drag it out to the station. Uh, 
So uh, I'm going to click on the building uh, template in my template sidebar here, and I'm just going to drag it out and drop it on my tag dictionary service. And what that's going to do is it's going to insert that component into the station for me. Now, uh, what did it really do in the background is under my files, it copied the NTPL file up to the supervisor so that there's a copy of that building NTPL template on the remote station. It extracted that template bog out of there and it copied that into the tag dictionary service because that's where I dropped it. And then it also um, extracted resources and put them potentially under this uh, PX deploy and the template name here. And, and it might have brought images and things in as well. So anytime you do a, a template deployment, it's going to copy the files over, extract them and put the, the bits and pieces where they need to be under the file space and, and in the component space, okay? Uh, another way that we can go about deploying these templates is that I can right click on uh, the template either up in the, in the sidebar or up in the nav tree and uh, it's kind of a weird name but it says export configs and what this is going to do is going to prompt me to save an XLSX spreadsheet somewhere under my workbench home or my Niagara user home under my workbench so it's going under my templates folder and it doesn't have to match but in this case I'm just going to leave it alone and say building XLSX and I'll save the file. Uh, if you have things in that bog file that are passwords, like if, if there was a, a credentials for a station connection or something like that, it's prompting me here to encrypt that uh, information in the spreadsheet so somebody can't just go in the spreadsheet and see what all my passwords are. But um, I don't have any passwords, so I don't need to encrypt the, the document here. And I also don't have any additional tags or anything that I want to set up, so I just hit no there. Uh, now, I can't uh, open the spreadsheet really in uh, Workbench here, but if I go uh, you know, look at this, I can click launch and it'll open up my uh, Excel spreadsheet, right? And uh, in this case, this is a very, very basic example. I'm going to show you uh, something more complex here with a, a device template in just a couple minutes. Uh, but what I want to point out here is there's some description information, the template name, the version, and, and we have some columns and things here. And the other thing that's important to understand with the spreadsheet is if we look at the name manager, uh, and this might be a little bit of an eye chart up there. Not sure how well you guys can see from the back of the room, but um, what this is, uh, I just want to point out is that the spreadsheet knows about the template that it was created from, right? So it knows the name of the NTPL file. It knows um, the title of it. It knows the UUID of the template that it was generated from and what version of the template and who the vendor was and things. So all that information is stored as metadata inside that spreadsheet, right? Uh, and so the idea here, if you hover over these cells that have the little red corner on them, it tells you the information. So what we want to do with the spreadsheet is we can say, hey, what's the slot path in a station where I want to go deploy this component template to or slot paths? Like, so for every row in the, in the spreadsheet, I'm telling it where in a station to go deploy this uh, thing as a template, right? Uh, and uh, so you still have to have some intimate knowledge about the station, obviously, right? And in this case, if it tells you no leading forward slashes or trailing, and uh, and it's going to start with whatever's at the root of the station, essentially. So uh, because if you're not cheating, you're not trying. That's what my engineer used to tell me all the time when I was on the boat. Uh, but I would want to deploy it, right, in this case, under the tag dictionary service. So I'm just going to copy that, come over here, and paste this into the cell. Now, what it's telling me is, uh, I don't want the station slot colon or anything and there's no leading slash so I'm going to delete everything up to the slot path there. So I'm just going to be left with services slash tag dictionary in this case. All right. Uh, you can also uh, configure the deployed name here. So like in this case, I'm just going to call it building. You could assign a display name here if you wanted to. If you really wanted to get uh, frisky, you can specify the XY coordinates of where in the wire sheet it's going to get positioned, how wide the glyph is going to be, and that kind of stuff too. Uh, but for me, in this case, what I want to show you, really this is all I, I need to configure uh, in the spreadsheet. So I'm just going to save it and close the, the spreadsheet out, okay? Uh, so. We want to talk about then how can I utilize this? So in my environment here, my supervisor is talking to several JSES. And if I look under my JSE controllers here at the tag dictionary service, you'll notice that I have a Niagara and a Haystack, but I don't have a building dictionary in my JSE stations. So what I want to do is uh, using the uh, provisioning in the supervisor then, 
uh, we've got the uh, Niagara network set up and I have I can go to the provisioning now if I want to use provisioning to deploy things with templates, I need to copy the template files and the spreadsheet up to the supervisor. So the supervisor has a copy of that. And we give you kind of a convenient way to do that here is this copy templates button on the provisioning manager view. When I click that, it's going to prompt me to select uh, a spreadsheet, a template file, and an Excel file. So I need to do the NTPL and the spreadsheet. So I'm going to pick my building NTPL and my building XLSX file here. I'll hit OK. And that copies it up to the supervisor uh, under a folder called template cache. Now, I could have done that myself. That's just a kind of convenient way of doing it. But basically, it creates this uh, template cache folder here under the file space, and it copied the NTPL and the spreadsheet up there. And I could have just done that manually, but it's just kind of a convenience to do it through the manager view. Okay. Um, once I have the files at the supervisor, I can click plus here, and there's a job step that's uh, to deploy a template. And uh, so what that's going to do is allow me to pick from my template cache folder, I'm going to pick the spreadsheet that I went through and, and put all the configuration information into, uh, and it's going to ask me for a password if it was you know properties that were password encrypted on the spreadsheet. And then I'm going to pick which stations do I want to deploy this against, right? So I'll say I want to go deploy this against these J stations. And uh, what will happen then when I run this job is the supervisor is going to go connect to all the stations that I told it to. It's going to copy the NTPL file out there, extract everything, and it's going to install the components wherever they were configured in the spreadsheet to be installed. And, and I realize this is uh, just one component being added to each station, but if you have a project where you've got you know, 10 or 50 or 100 or you know, God forbid thousands in some cases right on large projects, uh, then uh, it, this definitely gives you a quick way to do this engineering effort, right, and to be able to standardize on these things. Uh, when you, and you can see now that the uh, that building dictionary now is down in, in my J station as well. Uh, when you look at the any of the stations where you've deployed things using a template, we have a template manager view here. And this is going to show you all the instances of things in the station that have been deployed using a, a template, a component template or a device template. And it shows me the slot path to them, uh, the name of the template, who the vendor is, what the version of it is, if there's inputs and outputs and relations, are they linked and things like that, and what version uh, is installed and is it up to date. So this is going to let me know, hey, what version of my engineering standard is deployed on this project, right? So if down the road I decide I need to make changes to my design and my standard, then that's what we're going to do. And if I'm going to do something like that, and I realize this is just a very basic example, guys. I'm going to show you something a little bit more complex here in a minute. Uh, Probably the first thing I would do if I'm going to you know, make changes to my template is I would want to make a copy of the existing template because this is my you know, version 1.1, right? So before I make a change, I'm going to copy this file and then I would go paste it somewhere else that I would keep you know, a copy of that older version of my template, right? Uh, so then I can use my, uh, my template view here and maybe uh, I want to go under my tag definitions and I'm just going to keep this simple as well. I'm just going to duplicate one of these tags here and I'll call this like my campus uh, marker tag now, okay? And but obviously it could be way more complex than that. Once you make any kind of change, uh, the, the template gets set back into a draft mode to indicate that some change has been made, right? Uh, so I'm going to save my change and then I'm going to change it back to a ready state, which is going to have me want to increment my version number. So if I go take a look in my supervisor station where I deployed that template uh, manually and just by dragging and dropping it, I'll go take a look here at my template service and you'll see now that I have 1.1 version installed in the station, but I have version 1.2 available in my workbench client. So it's now telling me that the deployed template instance is out of date. I have a newer version available that I can upgrade. So to do that, you just select that item and you can click the upgrade button. And then it's kind of like the software manager. You're then going to do a commit and it's going to ask you, hey, are you really sure you want to do this? And I say yes, and it's going to go through. and. Really, it removes the existing thing, puts in the new version of it, and 
maintains the state of what things were and there's a document in the help that explains everything that gets maintained like links and relations and tags and um, uh, persistent properties and like states of history extensions and all kinds of things okay uh, now that's pretty easy when it's something like this in that station uh, and with provisioning we also have other job steps uh, that are related to um, uh, related to that as well uh, for doing things like updating uh, deployed instances. So uh, in this case, I made a change to my template file, right? So I'm gonna uh, click the copy templates button again. And in this case, I just wanna copy my building NTPL file up to the supervisor because that's 1.2 version. I need to go put that on my supervisor so it's available to push down to the J stations. And uh, once we do that, and I probably already have a job built or I could just do it here in, in, the, uh, in the view here. Uh, so here's a, a, job, a, a job prototype that I have set up. And in this case, it's saying, I wanna upgrade the deployed instances of the building template. So when you go to add job steps here, um, you'll see like there's the deploy template, which is the one I used a second ago. And then there's also like install application template. That would be a provisioning job that could install an application template to a bunch of edge controllers. Uh, there's also, um, there's uh, a uh, upgrade or update template or application template configuration. I'll talk a little bit more about configuration properties in a few minutes. Upgrade application template and then there's an upgrade template job step. So that, this is the job step that I'm running now. And when you click that job step, it just wants you to select the NTPL file. It doesn't need the spreadsheet because the thing's already deployed in the station and it knows what template they're deployed with and what version so it knows, hey, I don't have, uh, the list is everything that's in the station is what I'm telling it to go do in that case. Uh, so again, you tell it what stations to uh, go install that thing into and if I uh, just sort of expand this here and see the tag dictionary service and tell the job to run, uh, then uh, what'll happen is that that building dictionary will get deleted that's out there and then it'll get put back in uh, and probably happened, uh, yeah, we saw it actually, uh, disappeared there for a split second and, uh, and copied it back in. And then if I take a look at my template service in that remote station now, I'll see that the tag dictionary is up to my new engineering standard, okay? So it's real easy once you've created something like, a, you know, a dictionary, or sorry, a template of your tag dictionary, it's very easy to keep that in sync across all of your JSES and all your supervisors on a given project, or if you just change the way you do your engineering and things like that, and you're going from project to project, it's easy to know what version, okay? Uh, now, a, a bit more complex example is uh, talking about a component template. So in this case, I have a BACnet device here that has uh, multiple PX views assigned to it, has you know, a bunch of points already configured. Uh, the points have history extensions and alarm extensions and things like that, right? I may have data modeling assigned to it and everything. And this is my you know, standard device that my company installs uh, for uh, an air handler whenever we're doing projects, right? It could be a VAV controller, a fan box, a fan coil, air handler, whatever it might be, uh, and, uh, or a rooftop or something, right? So what I wanna do is I wanna create a template of this BACnet device. And the way I do that, same way I just did the component template, I'm gonna right click on it and I'm gonna choose make template. And this is going to, again, create, start that um, template wizard here. And I can give it a, a file name here. Again, I can save it in folders, uh, a vendor. I can give it a description, you know, VT8600, uh, you know, BACnet, uh, HU or whatever. And, and uh, I can say, you know, uh, VT8600, uh, you know, one heat gas, uh, one cool DX uh, with economizer or whatever I want to say here, right? Just give it some kind of description. And again, there's a component tab. I can get into you know, the wire sheet views and I can make programming changes and things like that if I need to. All your same kind of logic controls and stuff like that are there. Now, 
when we deploy a, a device template in particular, we're probably going to need to set some things uniquely on each deployed instance of that template. For example, uh, with the air handler here, it has an uh, address property, right? And the, uh, the address property uh, in this case is saying, you know, what's the network number? Uh, what's my MAC address? You know, what type of, uh, of uh, address style is it? Things like that, right? Those all need to be configurable because each device, when I deploy this thing, each device needs to have a uniquely set uh, address, right? Can't, they can't all be addressed the same thing. Um, I might want to add the enabled property as a configuration property so I can enable and disable device. Um, when you talk about BACnet objects, right, there's a device object and there's an object ID, right? So every, uh, every BACnet device on the network needs to have a unique device object ID. So that needs to be a configuration property. Um, things like set points, right, that I want to be able to change uh, set points. So like my uh, OCT cool set point or my OCT heat set point or, or it might be um, your box area, your K factor, your min max you know, flow set points and things like that. Anything you want to set uniquely needs to be a configuration property, right? Uh, then we also have uh, relations. And so relations, if hopefully everyone's familiar with data modeling, but relations are describing metadata in the application, saying how is the equipment related, like what, you know, what air handler supplies the VAV, or uh, what chiller supplies the, the coil to the air handler, or what electrical panel is this thing powered from, and, and, and those sorts of, of relations. Uh, in this case, I'm doing some haystack modeling in the station as well, so I want to set up a site ref relation saying uh, what uh, site component or what space, there might be a space ref or a site ref. Uh, in this case, I'll just show an example of, of doing a space ref. And uh, so the idea is you can look through the list or you can also just click the add button here and you can type in something ad hoc, uh, but I'll find HS site ref here. And when you add that, by default, it's going to be an inbound relation. But you can select that relation. You can toggle it here and reverse it so I can say it's an outbound relation. So I want to have a relation from my equipment to the site component to say this is a piece of equipment that's part of the site. And Within the data model in my station, I have an HS site marker tag on the thing that's the site component. So we have a relate hints property here, and what this is is an equal query to help you find and narrow down the things in the station uh, that would match. So I can say HS site, for example, anything with a site marker tag would be a candidate, candidate for me to want to relate this piece of equipment to. Right? So we're trying to narrow down the choices when somebody deploys it. And you can also put in a user tip to help them explain what are they doing in the process of deployment. Right? So select the desired uh, site component or whatever you want to give them as, uh, as a tip there. Okay? So you can add as many relations to or from this component, this device, that's once it's deployed in the station, we want to create those relations, right? match it up to things. We also have, obviously, the concept of uh, data links. Uh, so I have a schedule that's linked into my occupancy command, right? So uh, this, uh, right, get a little bit, if I can get my mouse to work, get a little bit more real estate here. Uh, so I have a schedule right now that was linked into N16 on this occupancy point uh, before I even created a template of it. So the template process creating it, saw that link and already created this for me. Um, and I have one for outside air temperature and there happens to be something linked into my unock cooling set point, which I don't really want in this case, so maybe I'll remove that one. Uh, you can add other links if you need to. So like, for example, if I wanted to link the output of the supply fan to something, I just double click on that and it adds another row here that's saying I need to link the out slot of, this, of my supply fan to something else in the station, right? Uh, so you can define what those links are going to be into and out of this device once I deploy it in the station. Similar to the relations, when you click on any of these links, you'll see in this bottom right corner, uh, there's similar things like a user tip. So I can say, uh, select uh, you know, the um, desired weekly schedule or, or whatever you want to give it as a, um, as a tip there. Okay? And 
in this case, in my station, I've got a bunch of uh, different schedules here, weekly schedules, and if I look at the tags on these schedules, we'll see that I've got a tag rule that actually applies a B colon weekly schedule marker tag to any of the weekly schedule components. So that's an easy way for me to find the schedules in the station that I can prompt the user with to say, which one of these schedules should you link to the occupancy, right? I want to narrow the list of things down. So uh, in this case, for my uh, buy intent, then I would put B colon weekly schedule. The target slot hint is uh, kind of not named well, I would say, uh, but what it's saying is what slot am I linking to or from? So if it's an inbound link, what's the name of the slot on the remote component I'm linking from? If it's an outbound link, what's the name of the slot I want to link to? So if it's an inbound link, in most cases, it's probably going to be coming from something called an out slot typically, right? But it could be something else. Uh, if it's an outbound link, it might be in 16 or in 10 or something, but you're just telling it which slot am I going to be linking to or from. Another change that we implemented in 4.13 is the slot path scope here. And what this is, I think that's a 4.13, might be a 4.14, my brain's slipping a little bit on that one. Uh, the idea there is you can, just like in the spreadsheet where I put the, like, uh, the path saying services slash tag dictionary, I can put a path and tell it to limit the scope of where it's going to go search in the station to do that in equal query to find the matching components. So that's a new, some new functionality that we've given you to kind of scope that down some. Uh, now, I would do the same thing for outside air temperature. In this case, I've got sort of a simulation point. If I look under my um, weather service here in my weather report, uh, I've got this component uh, here called current, and this has some tags on it uh, that uh, help me identify it as an outside air temperature sensor, right? So I have a HS outside air temp sensor marker tag, and I have, in this case, a B colon global trying to say, hey, I've got lots of OA temp sensors points on my station, but this is my global sensor, right? Uh, before we had the scope, then you really had to do something like put a marker tag on it to say that it's the global point, right, to help narrow things down. Uh, but in this case, what I could do is um, I could say, you know, select global OA temp sensor as my uh, uh, as my tip. My, uh, I want to link from the out slot on the control point. And my bind tip might just, in this case, be HS uh, outside air temp sensor. And the slot path scope could be you know, something to like this weather report or this weather service, right? So I could just say copy there. And uh, just like I did with the spreadsheet, I'm going to get rid of the, the leading station slot colon slash. And it's just going to be that slot path in the station. It's got to be an absolute slot path. And it's just saying, go narrow your search down to only find something under the weather service that has that outside air temp sensor marker tag on it, right? Uh, the other thing we have here is the graphics tab, and from here you can edit any of the graphics that are assigned to uh, components under the, the device. You could right click and add a new view here. Um, you can right click on, you know, and edit the existing views or remove the views and things like that, but it just lets you manage all the PX views that are assigned to this component. Um, the other thing that we do support, and, and I don't really suggest people do it, but we do have this concept of sub-templates, which I always joke around and say it's kind of like DiCaprio in the movie Inception, right? Like it's the dream inside of the dream inside of the dream, okay? Uh, the idea is that you could have like a cooling only VAV template, and then you could have a sub-template that was just your reheat coil, your hot water valve, your reheat coil, and, and your sensor or something, and you could drop that in as a sub-template of it. Or you might have an air handler template, and then you might create an analytics template that has like fault detection logic and drop that in as a sub template under your air handler or something like that. Uh, it, it's, it's supported, but it can get a little bit more complex and confusing, so I kind of steer away from it a little bit in that sense. But uh, now, as far as um, I guess I need to save this, right? It would be a good start. Uh, so once you save a template and you set it into your ready state and things like that, uh, just like a uh, component template, you could just drag and drop. Uh, so I could look at my um, 
device manager view here in BACnet, and I could just go select this template here, or the one I just saved, or, or the one I have already prepped, like the cooking show thing, uh, and I can drag that out and drop it onto my floor. Uh, the other thing that you can do, though, is when you, and I'm not going to find any devices here because I don't have any actual BACnet devices connected to my station, but there is a dev template mode that you can turn on here. And the idea is then when you go out on a job and you hit discover and you go find all these BACnet devices or LAN devices or Modbus or whatever, you can select them all and then you can pick the template that you want to use to add those devices to the station. So now they're going to come in with all the points mapped, all the histories, all the alarms, all the graphics assigned, everything to your engineering standard, right? Everything's in exactly the same spot and all that kind of stuff. Uh, now to show you real quickly how we can do this offline is if I select a template, then I can click new. And and I could say I want to add uh, maybe two BACnet devices here to the station. Typical new dialog, I'm just going to say OK. And what it's going to do is it's going to kick off the deployment process. And the same process happened with my tag dictionary template, but it was just really quick because there wasn't anything to pick from. I didn't set up any configuration properties or re relations or links or any of that kind of stuff, right? Uh, so in this case, you'll see then it says, all right, select the floor this AHU serves, right? And it's, it's trying to create the site ref relation for me. And it searched the station, and it only found one thing in the station that had that site marker tag on it. So it went ahead and selected it for me because there's only one option, right? So we're trying to simplify things here. So I click OK. Uh, then it says, all right, select the schedule, right? And uh, so it comes up with all these schedules that it found in the station using that uh, B colon weekly schedule marker tag. And if it's a long list, then you can uh, start typing things and narrow that list of components down as well, right? So it, if it really returned a long list. But this is trying to narrow down for whoever is deploying the template to say these are the likely candidates to link from to control my occupancy, right? So I pick the schedule and then it's going to say, hey, what about this outside air sensor, the global, and it found again, in this case, one component. So, and then it'll tell me, hey, this is what I did for you. I created all these data links, I created all these relations. In this case, it's just for two devices, but it might be for 25 devices or 50 devices or whatever you're adding to the station, right, at the same time. Then we get to the configuration properties uh, page, right? So this is where I would select, um, you know, a, an individual device and I would set maybe the device object ID and the MAC address, right? And I would do the same thing for the other air handler, right? And I could change my configuration properties like my my set points, my area, K factor, box flow, you know, things like that. And then you get one final dialogue that this says, hey, you know, do I need to change any of these things? And you can see that it added those devices, right? And these devices have the graphics assigned to them. They already have all the points mapped under them the way they were set up in my template. And they have all of the alarms and histories and all that kind of stuff as well, okay? Uh, the other thing that we can obviously do with this is that we can set up spreadsheets and we can export that uh, configuration. And I'll show you uh, an example of this here uh, of what the spreadsheet looks like. I'm going to got like maybe three minutes here to kind of finish up and then we'll take a quick break. Uh, and uh, so in this case, this uh, spreadsheet is a little bit more complex, uh, but you, you can see it's got a slot path at the BACnet network. Uh, I say you can see, right? Can you guys see that okay? Do I need to zoom in a little bit? Uh, the thing about Excel is it makes it real easy to do data entry, right? So like I can click and drag and, and it increments, you know, numbering schemes for my devices and my display names and, uh, and my names and all that kind of stuff, right? So it makes it really easy to kind of start plugging in values from equipment schedules and things like that. Um, you'll see in blue here are my data links. Um, so um, it, it uses kind of three columns here, but you're specifying the name of the component you want it to be linked to, what's the out, you know, the name of the slide is linked from, and is there a scope to narrow down to search for? Uh, just like I was uh, answering when I did the did everything manually, and uh, you can see for the relations, your configuration properties like object ID, MAC address, things like that, um, are all going to be able to be configured in this uh, spreadsheet, right? And so I can do this a lot more quickly, or I can have someone that's not as savvy about Niagara or the system to come in and do all this data entry and get everything set up. For me, uh, there's a couple different ways that we can uh, we can deploy this. Then, um, one way is to go into the um, template view in the station. Uh, 
So I'm going to go down to my J station here and go to the uh, template manager view again. And when I look at this view, there's a bulk deploy from Excel here. And what this allows me to do then is pick that spreadsheet and it's going to go through and do the deployment for me without me having to answer any questions because all the questions have already been answered in the spreadsheet. And it's going to deploy all those devices, create all the relations and the data links and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the other option that you have here is this update configs from Excel. So the idea there is uh, maybe I fat fingered those configuration properties when I was doing the data entry or something's changed. And what I can do is just go back into Excel and update all my configuration properties, come back in here and just say, push all these config properties out to all the things that are in the station. So it doesn't redeploy them, but it'll go through and set all the configuration properties up for me. Uh, and so that, that can be real helpful as well. Um, the other thing that you can do, which I already showed you, is uh, deploying using provisioning, right? So uh, using a provisioning job step, uh, I can use that to um, deploy uh, my, uh, using my spreadsheet, I can deploy that uh, same template out to another station here. So I'll show you under the BACnet network here, right? There's nothing under the station. So I can run this job and it'll connect to, again, the just like I did with the tag dictionary template, it's going to push that um, NTPL file out to the, to the J station and then it's going to, you know, extract the files out under the PX deploy and, and everything and it's going to start pushing devices down. Oh, got a failure there. Four, two, like, James, right? This is the other one uh, uh, building one for two. Yeah, it should have been. Should have looked at the uh, failure. Uh, oh, oh, it doesn't exist. <laughs> there. Yeah, that's a that's a good reason to fail, right? Uh, so I didn't copy my template uh, in my spreadsheet up to the supervisor. So I needed to have this NTPL file and this spreadsheet needed to be up in my template cache. And uh, then I can run it again. So uh, that was me just not following my own steps there. So um, it should start running and pop things in there. So, uh, so anyway, I just hopefully you guys take away from this is that uh, these are ways to enforce engineering standards uh, within your own company as well as multiple contractors working on the same project for a customer. Uh, it's in, 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 and you can change your engineering strategies and understand what versions have been deployed. And there's a lot of tools to be able to update and fix you know all these configuration property values and things like that. So you should really look at it. <laughs> yeah, like I was saying, it was, it was incredible the time savings that a uh, couple of couple of contractors we worked with that we were, we just it's a simple thing that's out there. It's been out there for a while, man. It, it's not a perfect fit for every device, by the way, like, and not, not knocking on any devices or anything, but the earlier generation spiders, for example, with the virtual XL10 bogs, some of the early disk tech, uh, earlier disk tech controllers don't work well because of a similar kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But, and John, you can, Hachi, you can confirm, right? The newer spiders, device templating works well with the newer spiders. The entire device, not just part of the application, as long as you do the entire device. All device awesome. that works fine. So, uh, so yeah, it's uh, it won't fit every application, and you know, not every one off. Like just because you got a you know physical plant with chillers and cooling towers and whatever doesn't mean go make a template of it. If it's a one off thing, probably doesn't make sense. But if it's something you use on every job, it probably makes sense. Yeah, super cool. So, all right, quick break. Yeah, sounds good. We'll just take a uh, five, ten, whatever heck minute break, and then filter back in. We'll keep going. But yeah, thank you, right. James. All right. James's next uh, presentation on HTML visualization and goes over some APIs. It's really awesome. Uh, can enable a lot of stuff for you guys, especially more technical ones, etc. Yeah. <laughs> Should be awesome. Lay on, James. All right. So, th everybody, if you want to quiet down, we'll go ahead and get started again. 
Uh, you got stuck with me for an extra little bit here, and then we're going to have uh, some uh, open Q&A kind of stuff. Uh, yep. So what we're going to talk about here is uh, HTML visualization, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, serving files from the file space, show you some examples of using HTML direct from the file space, and doing some other examples with like Apache Velocity and, and some uh, cloud-based type uh, dashboarding, like using something like uh, Grafana or Power BI or something to try to pull information from Niagara with some of the different APIs that are available. Uh, so a couple things just to kind of run through here and I'm going to kind of bounce back and forth a little bit between some PowerPoints and with Workbench and a browser to show you things. Um, we do support serving HTML files directly from the file space, but with that said, I, I would say there's a few caveats. Uh, one is that um, you don't really have version control, but that, that's kind of the same thing with just even PX files, right? If you've got PX files in the file space, then you don't know who edited them or you don't have a version control where you can revert to the previous version or things like that, right? But that's, so it's not really much different than, than having PX files directly in the file space. Um, the, I think the, the little bit of the aspect of it though is there, there's obviously you know vulnerabilities that creep into uh, JavaScript libraries or in the way HTML code's written and things like that. So it does put a little bit more onus on you for kind of making sure that your JavaScript and your HTML is up to date with like security type things where if it's packaged as a view in, in something in a module, then you're kind of getting the plumbing of, uh, of, the, uh, of the framework in general that's keeping all those uh, libraries up to date and things like that, right? So, but uh, it's just something to kind of be aware of a little bit, right? Uh, now, when you access files from the uh, station's file space, there's really two uh, file access methods uh, or servlets. One is this the uh, the file servlet, which is the top example, and I'll, and I'll show you these here in just a second in uh, the browser as well. And that's going to give you just the raw HTML file. And then the other one is the ORD scheme. So you have slash ORD and then the uh, file path to the file. That's going to keep it within the context of the profile you're logged in with. So if it's the HTML file, profile, you're going to have potentially the sidebars and things like that that are available and it's going to load the HTML within that view pane. Uh a couple other things to keep in mind if you're working with HTML files, the, the station does like to do what we call snooping, meaning it's going to look at the content that's going to be served up to the client and it's potentially going to massage some of the things that you have in the files. If you don't want it to, you just add a comment to the file and the comment syntax is slightly different between um, HTML and uh, CSS, but it's just a comment saying, hey Niagara, don't snoop on the file and modify anything. Uh, it's also pretty common uh, to want to use JavaScript libraries, right, with HTML. And, and that's one of the big tools and benefits of doing HTML is that there's all kinds of different JavaScript libraries out there that people have created that do all kinds of whiz bang cool stuff. So instead of you having to create all this functionality from scratch, you can just use one of these existing libraries. And there's uh, a, an application called Require.js, which is uh, it's a tool to asynchronously load JavaScript into your web page and uh, Tritium uses it quite extensively in all the, the core stuff that we do and we have plugins or, or the syntax and capabilities for you to leverage require JS as well. It can really help improve like the, the speed, the load times of your uh, web pages and your JavaScript code and that sort of thing. Uh, I've got a reference here and, and I assume we're going to be sharing you know, a PDF of the presentation so you don't have to necessarily worry about trying to jot all this down or take pictures of it uh, but there's a link there to the help file and it explains the syntax that you would put into your files if you're going to uh, leverage the required JS, right? And this is just a very, very basic example of an HTML page. So you've got your tags, and in this case I have the no snoop at the top as an example, and um, I have my JavaScript there that's loading the uh, required JS uh, libraries there. And this example really just does something basic. It's, it just opens up a dialog is really kind of all it does. Uh, so we'll go into the, um, the station here, and I'll take a look at my file space here and just show you that there's this basic HTML file here, right? I can look at the um, text editor view and see the no snoop syntax here. That's a comment. And then I have my two lines of JavaScript that are telling it to go load um, the uh, required JS uh, to use that library. And then I have just a real basic um, HTML page. So I'm using required JS to, to call a function here, uh, which is using Baja script. 
And all it's really doing is making an ORD that maps to the root of the station, and then I'm going to open up an alert, a dialog that says, hey, this is the station name. Like it's just a sort of a hello world example. Okay? So if I open up my browser, and uh, just to tell you, um, I, I have a client certificate authentication set up in the station, and my browser is configured with that PKI certificate. I didn't want to fool around with having to keep typing login names and passwords. So it's, I'm not using no authentication. I'm using client certificate here. So don't think I'm pulling the wool over your eyes when I click on this web page. This is going to load because the client certificate authentication does it in the background. Um, so this is that web page, and it's using the file uh, org here. You can see this file slash HTML basic HTML, and that just opens an alert that just you know gives me some information. Uh, if I look at the same web page, but I do it with the HTML5 profile, you'll see that it loads that content in the view pane, and I still get that same alert dialog. But in this case, my URL has that org path in it and everything, right? And so I get the, the Chrome of my profile, so I still get my nav sidebar and things like that, but I get HTML content served up from the station in that pane there. Okay. Uh, now, talking about those libraries, obviously, that help with JavaScript and everything, uh, we do have a Baja script library uh, that comes with Niagara. And this is a, a JavaScript library that we give you guys that, that helps you build uh, applications. So it's going to help you to resolve things in the station, to be able to display data, to read and write data, and things like that. And this is all covered in uh, mostly in the uh, doc developer. Uh, I'll show you. Uh, I can show you where that is. And uh, there's a lot of tutorials and things that uh, that you can get into. So. If I uh, take a look at the workbench help here, and you look under um, doc developer, and under the user interface topic, there's uh, the open web technologies here. And this goes into using required JS and serving HTML files from the file space, all that kind of stuff that I was talking about. Uh, but there's a help topic on uh, Baja Script here, which has all kinds of you know documentation about the different uh, JavaScript classes and what you can do. There's tutorials in here that you can click on and, and work through. Uh, there's also a, a palette, actually, uh, in the doc developer palette and when you look at the doc developer palette there's Baja script and Baja UX examples and things that you can drag into the station and what these will allow you to do is th they have uh, little components that you can uh, click on and this is going to load some JavaScript code and it's going to show you examples of how to do things with Baja script and then you can click the play button and the play button is going to do something like render some HTML content to show you what is you know what's this JavaScript actually doing okay so there's some functional examples here of doing different things with Baja script that you can start off with and kind of learn about as well as the, tutor the tutorials that are in the help section there all right uh, now in this case, uh, and I don't think, I haven't seen Aaron Rickle around or anything, but uh, this was something that Aaron and I worked on um, a little while ago for a customer. Uh, and so I'm going to kind of jump in with both feet here and just show you an example, and I'm going to turn around and kind of start showing you a little bit more basics about it. Uh, this station is set up as like an enterprise security station, uh, meaning like door control, access control, and that kind of stuff. And so there's um, intrusion zones and things that are set up and uh, the intrusion zones have an intrusion display meant to like arm and disarm the zone right as you enter or leave a building for like a burglar alarm type stuff right and this um, intrusion display from back in the AX days has this really crappy little Java based UI on it that mimics a keypad that would let me like arrow around to you know do things and interact to arm and disarm the zone right and at some point in time we kind of even those went obsolete we stopped selling those and we started just using uh, like Android tablets as intrusion devices and uh, with that we added a, a PX view here uh, to uh, the intrusion zone display. And so this is just a PX file that is designed to sort of mimic that and you could have that load up on you know uh, on the tablet and use that to arm and disarm zones and stuff uh, but that's not super sexy and maybe it doesn't work as well as it could you know as far as like playing sounds and all that kind of stuff so um, what we did in this case to you know help a customer and, and show sort of possibilities is 
um, we created uh, a uh, an HTML file and it uses JavaScript and everything as well. So when I look at the, um, and I'm not going to go into all the weeds on this by the way, but this is an HTML file. It's loading uh, JavaScript libraries, uh, loading the uh, required JS, and then it's using um, JavaScript to like uh, set some variables that are basically the slot path to the things in the station that we need to interact with, right? So it's setting it to this intrusion display and the intrusion zone itself uh, so that this, the HTML and the JavaScript can load that information and interact with it. Uh, it's relatively basic HTML, I would say. It's, it's basically loading a bunch of buttons and things like that uh, to, and labels. Uh, the, the meat of it, and uh, I'm going to show you much simpler examples here in a second, but the meat of it is basically just a lot of JavaScript that was written to interact with the buttons and, and the things on the page. Okay, So the idea there is uh, that I can have a, a graphic that's an HTML graphic that's been built, and this is uh, maybe a sexier, more functional um, graphic that's, that can load on any kind of touchscreen device, right, that has a client certificate to authenticate to the station. And I can do things like, you know, arm and disarm the, the zone or whatever, right, and I can interact with it to, you know, put in my pins and things like that, and I can arm and disarm the zone, whatever. And so you can make it look, you know, whatever color schemes and how you want to as far as, you know, the aesthetics of it and everything. It's a pretty flexible type thing to do. Uh, now, I'll try to show you, I'm going to step back because that's kind of a deep example, but I just wanted to show you it as an example. And we'll talk a little bit about um, Apache Velocity, and I'll start showing you some more basics of HTML uh, pages and some things that we can do in, uh, in the station here. So... Uh, there's something called Apache Velocity, which is not anything that Tritium created. It's actually, um, you know, Apache.org is the website. And what they've done is they've created a templating language that can be used in HTML. And it allows you to basically call uh, Java code inside of your HTML to do some cool things like dynamic content and, and to build things out in your web page. And so there's this whole VTL velocity templating language language that you can learn about. And there's information in, in the Workbench help, but you can also go to Apache's website and learn about the VTL language. Again, it's not something that Tritium created. We just implement it. Uh, so you'll see uh, directives that start with the pound character and uh, variables have, start with a dollar sign character. And you can do things, pretty creative things, actually, um, with this. All right? uh, so I'm going to go over and show you in the Workbench so let's go back here, and I'll close this out, get it out of my way. Uh, so there is an AX velocity, and, it, and it's AX because it started out in Niagara AX, and we just never renamed the module, but there's a velocity servlet component that you can drop into your station. So it's, in this case, under my uh, services here in my station, I have this velocity servlet that I've dropped in. And when you look at the velocity servlet, it has a configurable uh, servlet name property. So I'm going to access the velocity servlet in the station by going to the URL of the station slash velocity in this case. But you can customize it to be whatever you want it to be. Okay. And the uh, velocity servlet has this document manager view on it. And the document manager allows you to uh, define a, a, a name. Uh, so that's going to be the further path on the servlet. So it'd be slash velocity slash AHU01. Uh, and you're mapping that basically to an HTML file, but it, it's going to have a .vm extension on it because it's using the VTL syntax in it. But it's really just an HTML file. And so all I'm doing is defining that and mapping it to that HTML file. Okay. Now, the other thing is about these uh, velocity documents is you can give them what's called a velocity context. So I want to create a variable. In this case, the variable is named uh, device, right? And it's going to point to air handler one in the station. So I'm creating a variable that I can access in my JavaScript, in my HTML, uh, and, and do something with that, right? So the idea, if I go take a look at my... Um, uh, velocity document that I have here. I have this AHU uh, VM file, which again is really just an HTML file, right? So I can see HTML file. Uh, I've got 
but I'm using uh, this VTL syntax and I'm getting um, the variable, uh, the device variable from the velocity context so that I can get its display name of the component. Uh, or I'm using that to get the points extension here uh, from that component when it loads. And then I can uh, use a little script here that's going to get an array of all the control points uh, that are underneath that points extension. And then with HTML, and a little um, syntax here, I'm just doing a for loop that says, hey, go iterate through all these things I found and let's display some labels and, and values about the, uh, the content, right, the information. And it's referencing an external um, CSS file here, uh, which happens to be this CSS file right here. So that's how I'm going to do the styling, like the font size and the font weight and the colors and all that kind of stuff, right? So if I go uh, take a look here at my uh, velocity servlet, right? So the, the URL I'm connecting to the station, and then it's slash velocity because that's my uh, uh, servlet URL and then slash whatever the document name is. So this is a web page that's just loading and showing me the point data, you know, for this air handler, right? And if I change this to air handler two, then it's going to load the velocity document for air handler two, right? So that's you can see with just you know eight lines of HTML or something, and me declaring this velocity document, I'm able to create a web page that's going to display all this information for me, in, instead of using a PX page if that's what I want to do. Uh, now that's a very basic example, obviously. Um, there's lots of other examples that I can show you here, and I'll try to show a few things, and I want to show you some APIs and things as well, but I'll show you a little bit more with the velocity examples here. So in this case, um, I've got a velocity document called energy, right, that maps to this energy VM file, and then the, uh, the document has um, a variable called schema, and it maps to a JSON component that I have in the station here. And so if I go look at my, uh, my Google chart example here and I look at my energy data component, what this is is a JSON schema component and it's querying the station, uh, sorry, under here, not under config. Uh, it's doing a query here uh, for a history file uh, for a period of last week and then it's giving me you know, timestamp and value, right? So when I resolve that query, I'm getting a table of timestamps and values, right? Uh, and so I'm using that information here in my JSON uh, output and you can control you know, what the format of that data is. There's a lot of different uh, ways that you can make this data render uh, in, the, uh, in the JSON here. Now, in this case, I wanted to have an array that was the header and then arrays of the values, the timestamp and the value for that data, okay? Uh, when I take a look at my um, energy VM file here, uh, and just do the AX text editor, right? Uh, this, again, is not a lot of code, okay? What I'm doing is I'm loading a JavaScript library from Google, which is a charting library. And then uh, I have some JavaScript here and it's going to use that Google charting library and it's going to load the core chart function. And then when uh, the page loads, I'm going to tell it to call this draw chart function. And the draw chart function right here then says, I want you to go get your data by uh, reading this uh, JSON payload from the station. So go get my timestamps and value array and load it into this variable called data and then I'm going to tell it to draw a chart uh, with the options that I feed into it, right? So the idea here then is that um, I can have a web page being served up from my station using a Google charting library, right? And this is what the Google chart library, you know, what, the, what that chart looks like when it renders. But I can change, you know, that's an area chart, right? I can say, no, I, I want that really to be a bar chart or something and save it. And I just go back over here and, and refresh, right? And it's a bar chart, right? Instead of a line chart or an area chart or things like that. Uh, 
I have a, a, another example with, uh, and again, I'm just going to kind of work through these really quickly, but this alarm uh, example, it's, uh, it's basically mapping to these uh, three control points here in the station, right? So I have variables called critical, medium, and low that are variables in my velocity context. And so then if I look at my uh, alarm VM file here, uh, same kind of thing, instead of uh, like referencing a JSON schema and getting that JSON payload off of it, then I'm going to uh, declare the the data as rows here, and I'm using the velocity context. So I'm saying go get the critical variable and get the out slot and get its value. Go get the medium variable, get the out slot and the value and so forth, right? So I'm loading the data from the station using that velocity context, and now I can tell the Google chart library to um, you know display uh, charts to display that information, right? So uh, these are just other examples. So like this is a Google uh, pie chart or donut chart if you specify, you know, the middle of the chart to be a, a hole. Um, and these are, you know, bar chart examples, right? And so maybe these are nicer different charts that you want to utilize in your UI with your customer. You can build these kind of HTML files and reference these JavaScript libraries. Um, there's a uh, uh, this is a, a gauge example. Uh, this one has uh, again some some variables which are uh, the uh, the power, the water, and the gas. Right. So these are context uh, velocity context variables that are mapping to these points in the station. And uh, this is a bit more of a complex example, showing you uh, because it, it will it can get more complex. Obviously uh, that you need to do some things, right? Because right now what I've shown you is just really um, is reading initial values, but if those values change over time, you'd have to refresh the web page to see things update. So in this case, uh, I'm still using the, the Google charting library, uh, but I'm also using the required JS here. And uh, what I'm doing is using required JS and, and the Baja script library, and I'm going to actually subscribe to those components in the station. So then the web page will get value updates whenever the value is changing in the station and I can dynamically change the content that's being displayed in the web page then, right, by having a subscriber that's going to keep the variable up to date in the station. Uh, so what that looks like in, in that case is uh, this is a, an example of using the Google gauge library and uh, so you have control over styling of what do the gauges look like, where do my, you know, uh, orange, yellow range colors and what's the scale and all these kinds of things and the web page is subscribed to those data points so as the values change you can see the the gas gauge is ticking up slowly and the other two gauges are moving around or whatever right so I have to incorporate a little Baja script to get the values subscribed and updated and then I'm using JavaScript with the Google charting library maybe uh, to show you what some of that stuff looks like right uh, What's important also from a cybersecurity standpoint to understand when you're working with things like this is that um, the, the web server itself has a lot of protection built in for the client browser uh, to protect it from nefarious code and things that might be going on, right? So you have the um, HTTP header providers under the web service and these have things like cross-site scripting and, and settings and stuff like that. Uh, in this case, most importantly is the content security policy setting. And uh, what you'll see here is that I had to make some changes to this to allow that type of stuff to work, right? So, for example, when the web page loads, the, the server tells the client, is it okay to load um, this information from somewhere? So, like, the script source says, uh, is it okay to, I had to add... Um, uh, an entry here to say it's okay to go load JavaScript from this URL from Google's website, right? Because I'm referencing those Google libraries, right? So I had to tell the station to tell the client browser it's safe to go load this JavaScript from some external server, okay? Um, I had to do the same thing like with styling because the, the Google uh, JavaScript library also uses uh, CSS files on their own website, right? So I had to tell the client browser it's okay to go load this CSS file from this remote server. So just understand if you are doing stuff like this that you do have to go in and tweak some of these um, HTTP header providers in particular to allow some of that stuff to load, okay? Uh, all right, so 
We also want to show you some uh, external web content. And well, actually, let's talk about Baja UX real quick, too. Uh, so, Baja script we already talked about, and I know the terms get a little confusing at times, a little overlap or something, but uh, we also have something that's called Baja UX. So Baja script is a JavaScript library that helps you build web applications. Baja UX is a framework that allows you to package HTML views and CSS and things into a module, and you can assign it as an agent or a view on, you know, on things in, in Niagara. And this allows you a lot more power uh, and what you're doing, it, it lets you build things that can be just displayed as a web widget in a PX view. And it's going to leverage all the improvements that, that Tritium does with each version. Like when we update all the core libraries, the, the required JS and the D3s and the, you know, whatever else is getting used, then you just get that benefit of Tritium helping maintain that infrastructure at the latest versions and the patches and things of that nature. Okay, uh, Very similar to what I was showing you uh, with the uh, with the Baja script, if I take take a look at the uh, the help also under that same doc developer and open web interfaces, uh, there's a Baja UX topic here, and again it has all the information um, about the different um, classes and stuff that you can use, things you can do, has tutorials like getting started, making your first Baja UX widget and everything. So it takes you through all that kind of stuff if you want to get into the um, Baja UX development side of things, and also. Uh, in that same uh, doc developer palette, you'll see just like there were Baja script examples, there's Baja UX and Spandrel examples that you can drag into the station. Uh, and uh, same kind of concept is that uh, when you go to those, they have a bunch of JavaScript and everything, and it's showing you examples of how to work with Baja UX. You have that play button you can click and go through and see what the visualization looks like. So there's tools there to kind of help you um, work that out and, and play around with it. Uh, and just to give you an example of, of what I mean by all this is uh, there's uh, uh, where am I my gauge example right so what this is is a web widget and uh, I, it came out of the doc developer palette. So I just drug out this uh, example linear gauge. And really what this is is just a web widget, just like a web chart or a gauge widget, you know, circular gauge or things, right? It's just a web widget. And it's telling it to go load uh, some JavaScript code out of the module, right? Is, and that's what's telling it how to render this widget. So uh, that's what, I, what gets included into the module would be JavaScript, CSS, potentially HTML, uh, uh, that's going to render this web content. And if we take a look at the uh, the modules folder here, I can show you where you can go uh, look at this. So if I look under uh, modules and uh, uh, not going to help me. So uh, doc developer, right? If we look at the doc developer jar file uh, and uh, look under examples and Baja UX here, uh, we'll see that what it's doing is it's telling it to go load this um, linear gauge JavaScript file. So this is the actual JavaScript that's making that gauge render as a widget inside the PX view. So you can package all your JavaScript and your CSS up inside the module and have it where somebody can just drag a web widget out and point to that JavaScript file and that's what's going to render the content. So it's a little bit easier to support and maintain in the long run over just serving HTML uh, straight out of the file space. Uh, so uh, it's, it's something to kind of consider if you're really going to get deeper into this stuff. Now, uh, there's lots of cool things that you'll find on the internet, right? Um, and for example, um, I guess I should actually go here first, right? Um, so windy.com is kind of a, a cool website uh, and it shows uh, not just weather data, but wind data. Like, so sailors and people like to use this to see, you know, what kind of winds are going to be forecast and, and things like that. And uh, they have tools here and they keep um, moving stuff around on their website and uh, I'm trying to remember where um, they've moved it to, but there's uh, there's some tools where you can uh, embed um, their widget inside of your own HTML page, right? And so what I did on the uh, on the Niagara side of things, then, and well, let me show you this other one too, real fast. So um, 
Weather Widget IO is, is another example of a site. And so they have things like these forecast widgets and you can customize like units and locations and all that kind of stuff, right? And you can say get code and it basically copies the HTML to your clipboard so that you can go embed this into your own web page, right? So uh, now there's obvious security concerns a little bit here, right? And I'm not necessarily endorsing and saying go, you know, use these specifically, uh, but it's it's easy to potentially embed web content from maybe uh, an HTML uh, occupancy sensor, like you got a Wi-Fi occupancy sensor that has an HTML view on it or something like that. Uh, it could be uh, some kind of web server in the building and you want to embed the content from that web server into your graphics, or it could be some external server like I'm showing you uh, in this example. And uh, let me collapse some of this stuff and, and get it out of the way here. Uh, so if I take a look at my um, HTML folder here, I've got an example of uh, this uh, windy.html here. So you'll see it's a really basic HTML file. Uh, this has a title and then I'm using an iframe and I'm telling it to go load this uh, URL and I'm passing in the parameters for the latitude and longitude and the units and stuff like that. And I'm just saying go load this web page from this external server as an iframe in, uh, in Niagara here. Uh, and I can do the same thing, uh, for example, with uh, that widget, uh, weatherwidget.io. Uh, I have an HTML page here and it's, you know, it has a, a hyperlink to that web page and then there's a script function uh, which is telling it go load uh, some JavaScript from this external server and it's going to display that content, right? So uh, we can see that in, uh, in my browser here. Uh, I can see the individual pages being served up from uh, from the station, right? So this is just using the file or servlet, and I'm just telling it to load that HTML page. Uh, and I can see the same thing with um, Anaheim weather, like it's showing me this um, weather forecast widget that they have. Uh, we can embed all this into a PX view if, uh, if we wanted to, right? So um, I've got a, uh, an example of, of a PX view here, right? And so what I did in this case was I just set up a, a normal PX view and what these are is uh, web browser widgets and I'm just telling it to go to the URL of that station to display the, the windy HTML file or the, or the Anaheim weather file or whatever. And so this is HTML content then that is being rendered inside of a, a PX page as um, um, as iframes, right? So again, I had to go set some things on my HTTP header providers to say, hey, it's okay to load this JavaScript from this website, or it's okay to load this um, CSS styling from this website, or something like that, okay? All right. Um, the other thing we want to talk about here is APIs. And <coughs> You've heard the term probably from a lot of people already today about open connectivity and using APIs to access data and things, right? So th this is just, it's not an all-inclusive list, but these are probably some of the easier or more popular ways or APIs to get data in or out of Niagara. And I'll go show you some examples of these here uh, as well. Obix has been around for a long time. Uh, we use, you know, have, have had that since the late R2, early AX days, uh, but it does provide uh, RESTful Web Services API to allow um, something external to query data from the station, uh, histories, alarms, real-time point data. Uh, we have Niagara Analytics, which has a whole web API uh, thing that you can drop in. It's a servlet, and there's, there's support to allow external applications to obviously authenticate to the station, but then send HTTP requests and get information, real-time data, trend data, and things. Um, that JSON schema component that I showed you earlier, I'll show you an example of that. It has actually an API to it as well. You just send an HTTP GET with that uh, org and it'll give you back the JSON payload off of the schema component. Uh, there's also things with the HTTP client driver. There's a string servlet that allows you to kind of not be a developer but use some building blocks and create messages that would allow API integrations with the station. You could also, if you are a software developer or you know, there's people at Cochrane Supply obviously that are capable that you might uh, contract Cochrane Supply uh, that could build a custom servlet for you as well if you needed to do a custom API integration. And... Uh, 
Um, Kevin Mamachek will talk tomorrow and show you some more about Niagara Cloud Suite. I'm going to show you a couple of things, so I'm going to steal some of his thunder probably uh, and uh, show you a little bit. But uh, oh, <laughs> who gets to go first, right? Um, and uh, show you a couple of these examples. Okay, so um, we'll go through and, and try to show you some of this real quick and how it might get leveraged. So. All right, so in my station, I have an OBIX network in my station. So let me collapse some of this stuff here. Right. And uh, so under my drivers, I have an OBIX network set up here. And when you look at the OBIX um, network um, and the, uh, the server, there's a servlet, right, it, that's configurable. It's just slash OBIX, right? So if I go uh, to that URL um, in my station, um, I'll just go to the root of it, right? That shows me uh, the, the root of the station, and then I can drill into things like get into the histories or uh, get into the config space, and I can start navigating through services or drivers and things like that, right? And so this is just sending an HTTP GET message to the station. The station's responding with XML, okay? Uh, so uh, one example is like uh, I might uh, want to query the history, right? And uh, it's just going to, uh, that was the wrong one to click on. Uh, uh, history query right there. Uh, you know, it's just going to give me XML back with all of the date timestamps, right? Is XML um, attributes or XML tags, right? So that's one way that you can kind of get API access to things in in the station. Uh, there's also, like I mentioned, uh, Niagara Analytics. And uh, with Niagara Analytics, if you look in the um, Analytics palette, there's a uh, web API component here uh, that you just drag into um, the service, right? And you configure what's the URL path of that servlet to the Niagara Analytics. And this, there's a whole doc that explains what's the format of the HTTP GET message or post message that you're going to send and what do you need, you know, what needs to be in that um, request. That, but you can request real-time data as well as historical data. And it's all based on the taxonomy, the ontology, your metadata, right? So I can say, go give me specific information from the station. Um, as far as sort of examples of some of this stuff, um, this is just uh, the Postman desktop application. If you're familiar with Postman, uh, curl, there's different applications to send uh, HTTP messages and things like that to, um, a to a server and get information back, right? So in this case, I'm just showing, uh, sending the, the URL to the OBIX servlet to query the history. So when I uh, send that request, I get back this XML in that client application, right? So I can use that to then create a chart or a table or something like that. Um, the analytics APIs are HTTP posts. So in this case, I'm sending a, a post to uh, slash NA, Niagara Analytics is the, the URL for the servlet, and then I have to tell it what kind of request it is. So in the body of the HTTP message, you're telling it it's a request, and I want to say, give me all the children of this node in the station, and uh, it'll give me uh, back information about all the things that exist in the station. Uh, but there's um, value requests for analytics. So I can say, give me the value of um, this um, this. Uh, component in the station, and I want to know what the HS or H4 energy tag is, or the HS energy tag is, and so it's going to use the data model to go find that information and give me something back here. Okay, uh, so there are lots of different ways with um, the in the JSON uh, toolkit example was that JSON schema is just an HTTP GET. Uh, where the, the URL is going to be the whole path to that uh, JSON schema component, and it's using the JSON exporter view on it, but it's going to give me back um, some JSON, right, which is JavaScript object notation, right? It's structured um, JavaScript with key value pairs and things like that, right? So again, this is data that can be digested real easily by something else, okay? So what's that something else, right, other than Postman, because Postman's like a testing tool, right? Uh, so um, 
in this case, I'll, uh, I have a, a Grafana server running locally on a, a, a Linux machine, uh, a Linux VM on my machine here. And what Grafana is, is a dashboarding tool that allows you to, and they have all kinds of cool widgets and stuff like that. So I configured a connector from Grafana and told it how to authenticate to my Niagara station, right, because it, it has to authenticate. And then for each of these um, widgets here, uh, you can configure uh, how that, uh, what that query does, right? So in this case, I'm using uh, an infinity data source here, which is just a standard data source that comes with uh, Grafana. And then you can tell it, like, what kind of data are you going to get back from your query? Is it going to be JSON? Is it going to be XML? And then you say, all right, what's my uh, URL, my API URL that I want to send the, the request to? And is it an HTTP GET or is it an HTTP POST and that sort of thing? And then you can tell it how to parse that information. So that's the one thing I'd say is the biggest hurdle is understanding how to parse the data that comes back uh, in that response, right? Is telling it either a JSON path to extract the information or this is an XML path saying go get these elements out of the XML and that's what narrows it down to give you the information um, that you want to display and you can change the, the style of the widget and things like that. Um, so this is just another example, uh, but it's using the JSON uh, schema component. So again, it's, a, it's an HTTP GET, uh, and I just have the URL to that JSON component, and then I have to tell it how to drill into um, the, the results there uh, to get the information out of it, right? Uh, I can try to show you what I mean by that. I, probably sounding a little bit abstract here, right? So um, let me just copy all of this text here. It, this was the response from this um, JSON uh, query that I got from the station, right? And uh, there's websites that uh, let you kind of play with JSON or XML, right? Uh, and uh, so I'll just delete all this out of here and paste this in here. Uh, so there's help built into these types of things. Like you click on this and it'll tell you dollar sign means the root of the object. And then you can uh, reference arrays with the dots and square brackets and, and you can do things to, to step through it. Uh, so the, the idea is if I say dollar sign, right, that gives me this whole um, array over here. Uh, try to get this thing scrolled up to the top really fast, right? That uh, gives me the whole array. Now, if I want um, just the history results because I don't want the key value pair that says station and current time and all that, then I would put dot history results. And so that takes this JSON path and it applies it to the payload and it gives me the filtered results out, right? And so then I can start stepping through that array if I wanted to say, oh, just give me, you know, element two out of that array, then it's going to get me down to that specific timestamp value pair or something that I want to look at, okay? So this is what I'm trying to explain to you is that on the Grafana side of things, you have to tell... Grafana how to parse the data that it gets back in the response, right? Whether it's XML or JSON or whatever, you're telling it how to go extract the bits and pieces that you need to be able to display the information here, right? So there's things that can display gauges and different types of bar charts and all that kind of stuff. Um, and this happens to be, so Grafana, you can run it on the local on-premise, uh, but there's also a, a cloud environment. And uh, I won't steal much of, uh, of Kevin's thunder here, but just to show you um, that, too late. Uh, so uh, this is a, a Grafana instance that actually is running in the cloud. Like, so it's hosted on grafana.net, uh, right? And these um, queries are using uh, Niagara Cloud APIs. So instead of it being on-premise talking directly to the station, uh, the station is exporting data up to the Niagara Cloud, and there's APIs in the cloud that allow Grafana Cloud to talk to Niagara Cloud, query for the data, log in obviously, but query for the data, and then be able to display it in dashboards and things like that as well. Uh, so it depends on whether you're trying to keep everything on-premise or you're trying to do stuff that would be more at, at a a higher level at a cloud level, then these are all kind of things that you can do as well. So if you want to kind of up your game a little bit and do some cool stuff with your visualization, then learning more about JavaScript and HTML and how you can ref, you know, use some of these other libraries and do some kind of cool stuff with your graphics is sort of the next step on things. 
So, under the wire, 33 seconds to spare. <laughs> Woohoo!